the word icon is one that's chucked about a lot and used for people who really don't deserve it. However, if there, if we are going to look at genuine icons in movies or music, Audrey Hepburn is definitely up there. I'm going to play the trailer for the, her movie Breakfast at Tiffany's in a moment, but I'm more interested to compare it to the book, which is somewhat different in tone. And you can see how the book was... Uh, Themes have been softened in the movie due to the American political situation of the era and so as not to offend people. I'll play the trailer and then talk about that. Won't you join me? Yes, join Audrey Hepburn as you've never seen her before, kicking over the traces and bringing to life Truman Capote's Breakfast at Tiffany's. I never could do that. Audrey Hepburn as Holly Golightly, who typifies and glorifies the glamorous playmates of this dizzily spinning world as she and George Peppard breeze through the glitter and shimmer of New York as it has never been captured before. You have a special invitation to attend Audrey Hepburn's open house on the wildest night New York ever knew. Oh. oh, good evening, Ed. I'll tell you one thing, Fred, darling. I'd marry you for your money in a minute. Would you marry me for my money? In a minute. So I guess it's pretty lucky neither of us is rich, huh? Please, darling, don't sit there looking at me like that. Holly, I'm in love with you. So what? So what? So plenty. I love you. You belong to me. No. People don't belong to people. Of course they do. I'm not going to let anyone put me in a cage. I don't want to put you in a cage. I want to love you. Audrey Hepburn and George Papard, searching for love in the big town, but sharing only part of their lives until they find the deep, warm moment of truth that can't be hidden, even by the oddball antics on the brittle surface of New York. <laughs> Breakfast at Tiffany's has remained a popular movie since 1961 when it was released. It's now edging up in years. But the clothes Audrey Hepburn wore in it, especially her look in the slinky black dress, had become an icon copied by clothes designers, girls looking to achieve a certain look. And the movie itself was wildly popular at the box office. However, not all reviewers enjoyed it. This is A.H. Whirler writing for the New York Times in October the 6th, 1961. As implausible as ever, but in the person of Miss Hepburn, she is genuinely charming, el elfin waif who will be believed and adored when seen. George Peppard is casual and for the most part a subdued citizen who seems to like observing better than participating in the recordings. Martin Bolson makes a properly brash, snappy Hollywood agent. Mickey Rooney's buck-toothed myopic Japanese is broadly exotic. Patricia Neal is simply cool and brisk in her few appearances as Mr. Peppard's sponsor, and Villa Longa is properly suave and continental as Miss Hus Hepburn's P Brazilian, while Buddy Ebsen has a brief poignant moment as Miss Hepburn's husband. Um, probably the most dated thing in the movie is Mickey Rooney's buck toted giant Japanese turn. It's impossible to watch that nowadays without being horrified. It's so It's so ridiculous. Even in 1961, it must have appeared a bit odd. Leaving that aside, Truman Capote's book and the movie bear some resemblance to each other, but the longer the movie goes on, 
the further they depart from each other. This is the original novel the movie is based on. As you can see, it's a relatively short book. In this edition, it's 130 pages long. It starts in the first person with the p protagonist recalling the past. I am always drawn back to places where I've lived, the houses and the neighbourhoods. For instance, there is a brownstone in the East 70s, where during the early years of the war I had my first New York apartment. It was one room crowded with attic furniture, a sofa and fat chairs upholstered in that itchy red velvet that one associates with, with hot days on a train. Straight away you can see the narrator is setting a tone of a, a New York that's slightly run down. Brownstones were once luxury buildings, but the area he's talking of in New York had by the 1940s come down in the world. One key difference between the book and the movie is that the movie transposes a setting to the early 1960s, where the author has it taking place in the 1940s. Also, he talks about Holly Golightly, and she does appear, of course, in the text, but there's no happy ending. People who have seen the movie will, of course, recall the famous scene where Audrey Hepburn's character of Golightly runs after the car, and they're all reunited and all ends happily. Nothing like this happens in the book. The book is downbeat, to say the least. Golightly fades out of the text after a certain point. The book opens with people trying to find out what's happened to her. No no real conclusion on it is ever discovered. Uh, a, a bar owner had received some photos of a statue of her made by an African woodcarver that may or may not be her. In fact, that also has a particular add-on sequence which would have caused horror if it had been put on movie screens in 1961 America. This part of the text talks about how um, Holly Golightly was the only person to remain well out of a party of other people in Africa. I'll read it out. The men, both red-eyed and fever, were forced for several weeks to stay shut and shivering in an isolated hut, while a young woman, having presently taken a fancy to the woodcarver, shared the woodcarver's map. I don't credit that part, Joe said squeamishly. I know she had her ways, but I don't think she'll be up to anything as much as that. I cannot imagine a movie made in 1961 which would suggest that a white woman was sleeping with an African. There are a few movies, of course, from roughly the same time period that go so far as to suggest a, a white woman sleeping with a black American, and they caused enough uproar. A movie on a 1961 screen in America suggesting a white woman and an African man engaged in a sexual relationship would probably cause mass, mass problems. I can imagine the director and the studio being slated and suffering severe financial penalties. Bear in mind, in this era, there were still miscegenation laws on the books which actually made dating and marrying a black person a, a crime in much of America. And some people were, were still being arrested for it as the movie was made. The movie is a confection. It's an enjoyable confection. It's it's scene setting is fantastic, and it's a dazzling, dazzling jewel in that respect. Although the Japanese Bucktoothed character does rather drag it down and look rather stupid, and whoever agreed to give Mickey Rooney a turn as that should have known better. And Mister Yunushi's character only features for a few lines in the original text, as he is anyway. He's hardly the most prominent character. Where the book and the movie really do depart is the book makes it plain that Holly Golightly, for all her charm and wit, is a really d seriously damaged personality. Some of that carries over to the movie, but she appears more eccentric than damaged, whereas the book eventually reveals she's a child bride. She comes from a... I hesitate to use the term, so forgive me. What might be called a white trash background in Texas. She was married very young became dissatisfied with her life and came to the city. There is no happy ending, as I said earlier, in the mo in the book. Holly Golightly eventually fades out of the... and sends a brief note to the protagonist. There is no resolution, no great romance. Golightly is a, an eccentric, damaged personality where, just like the movie, she has a cat, but unlike the movie... Her house is a wreck. Her charm is something 
She puts on and off. She does not live in a well-furnished, lovely apartment by any means. I prefer the book, but then I'm a cynic and rather grim by nature. Other people will prefer the movie because they want some light relief. I don't. I can only advocate for myself by saying the book does a far better job of recalling a particular time in New York's history and setting a mood for me. 